Hi folks, uh, today we're going to talk about uh, monopoly. So basically we're going from one extreme to the other. We're going from um, perfect competition, uh, which actually does not exist in the United States, to monopoly, which also does not exist in the United States. So uh, we're, we're using two extremes that are not existent in the United States, but uh, nevertheless, they're interesting because they give us a lot of insight on how decisions are to be made. Uh, first of all, what is a monopoly? A monopoly is a single seller of a product that has no close substitutes. So it's very easy. You know, you cannot be a monopoly and there would be other products that are good substitutes for your product because then you are not a monopoly. People would just substitute something else. So single seller, no close substitutes. Then the next question is, well, is it okay to be a monopoly? Is it legal? And the answer is, uh, yes, it is legal for the most part. It is legal, for example, and I'll give you an example how come it's legal. Uh, imagine that uh, you come up with a brand new product and it's a great product. Uh, it's gonna dominate the market. Well, what are you gonna do first thing first? You're gonna put a patent on it. Well, when you put a patent on that product, you are actually creating a monopoly. You're the only one who can produce that product. So uh, for a monopoly to exist, there has to be, there have to be some barriers to entry. For a monopoly to exist, they have to be able to prevent others from coming into the industry. Remember, that was not the case with perfect competition. With perfect competition, it was easy to get in, easy to get out. So we need for a monopoly, We need barriers to entry. And an example of a barrier to entry that I gave you is a patent. Well, a patent is a legal barrier to entry. So legal barrier. And the reason why we have those legal barriers to entry is because the government wants to encourage innovation. They want to encourage people to invent and innovate. And therefore they allow them to have monopoly so they can earn some profits. And that encourages other people to go in and innovate and invent new products. Otherwise, otherwise their products would be immediately copied and they would not make any profits. And therefore it would discourage innovation. Another barrier to entry is economies of scale. And with economies of scale is basically where a company grows big. And as a result of growing big and big and big, they're able to bring the cost down and down and down. And therefore, they're able to uh, move competition out of the industry because nobody can compete on cost with them. And this would be called a natural monopoly. A natural monopoly is a monopoly that, that has developed by bringing the cost down, getting bigger and bigger, getting economies of scale, and as a result, uh, being able to drive the competition out. And probably the closest that we have to this would be maybe uh, companies like Amazon or Walmart, where uh, they are so big and the costs are so small that they're able to kick mom and pop stores out of it. So this is called a natural monopoly. Another case where we could have a monopoly is when uh, a firm uh, is the sole owner of a resource that is needed to produce a certain product. So uh, obviously, if you're the sole owner of a resource, uh, then nobody else gonna be able to acquire that resource and you're gonna have a monopoly in producing a certain product.
Now, I don't want to get into the legalities of it, but I just want to tell you that uh, would, would it be okay for a company to become a monopoly because they come up with a new engineering know-how or manufacturing know-how that brings the cost down, brings the prices down, and no, since nobody else has it, they're able to kick the competition out? And the answer is, of course, yes. Now, would it be okay if a company becomes monopoly because a, a bunch of them are merging together? And the answer is maybe. Uh, if, if it is deemed that the merger of those companies, it, uh, it is dangerous to uh, the national security, uh, then Congress would not allow it. Uh, for example, if Delta would want to merge with American Airlines, uh, chances are that Congress would now allow that merger, would consider that it creates too much monopoly power for the newly, uh, newly merged company. Uh, but in other cases, uh, we had a case a few years back where um, uh, two satellite, the only two satellite radio companies in the US wanted to merge. And uh, they went before Congress with a, a bunch of lawyers that, that uh, pleaded on the fact that, well, it should be okay. And a bunch of lawyers that said, no, 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 that's creating a monopoly. And sure enough, uh, it was a monopoly in the satellite business. Only two companies merging together, that becomes only one. Uh, however, the other side was able to prevail and Congress allowed the merger of XM and serious because they said, the other side said, well, you know what? They have a lot of competition from terrestrial radio stations. So there's a lot of competition. So it depends on how you look at it, okay? In the satellite uh, radio business, certainly it's a monopoly, but in the radio business altogether, it's not a monopoly. Uh, so whether you're a monopoly or not also depends on how you look at it. Uh, for example, uh, let's say the school, the Miramar, offers me the sole license of selling coffee on campus. For all we care, on this campus, I would have monopoly. But that doesn't mean that I have monopoly over coffee in San Diego or in the United States. But on campus, I certainly have monopoly. So a little bit depends on how you look at it the perspective of where you are. Okay, now let's talk about uh, the demand for a monopoly. Uh, monopoly is the only company and therefore they are facing the whole industry curve. And we know that the industry demand curve for any product is a downward sloping demand curve. Remember we talked about the demand curve for a firm in perfect competition that is a straight horizontal line but for the industry itself was a downward sloping line. It implies that if you wanna sell more, you have to lower the price. Higher price, lower quantity demanded, lower price, higher quantity demanded. It was just that for the monopolist, the firm itself was one of the many, many, and they could sell at the market price, they could sell as much as they wanted. For the monopolist, that's not the case. For the monopolist, they are facing the whole industry demand curve. And therefore, if they wanna sell more, they have to lower the price. To give you an example, let's suppose that uh, Microsoft is the only operating system. It's not, but let's suppose that it is. Uh, well, Microsoft can charge any price, but if they charge a very high price, quantity sold is gonna be low. If they lower the price, quantity demanded is gonna be higher. And therefore, they're facing a normal demand curve where the price is high, quantity demand is low, price is lower, quantity demand is high. So let me write this down on the board. put dollars here 
because we're not going to have only price, but also cost on this axis. So it's going to be measured in dollars. And here's going to be the output. And the demand curve is going to look like this. Now, again, the implication is that if the monopolist wants to sell more, they're going to have to lower the price. However, here's a thing that has to be remarked. If the monopolist wants to lower the price, if they want to sell more and they lower the price, they have to lower the price on all the units. Okay. Now, here's an example of what's happening here, what the monopolist cannot do. Imagine that I come to class and I say, I want to sell this eraser. And I want to get $21 for it. No one in the class offers me $21. Okay, 21, nobody buys. So I say, okay, I'll sell it for $20. One person, only one person is willing to offer me $20 and they say, I'll buy it for 20 bucks. Sell it to them for 20. I go back to my desk. I take out another eraser and I say, I have another eraser for sale. $20. Well, the person who bought it for $20, they already bought their eraser, so they're not going to offer any more money. So for me to sell the second eraser, I'm going to have to lower the price. So I say $19. One person says, I'll take it for $19. Okay. I go back to my desk. I take out a third eraser. I say, who's going to give me $19? The person who was willing to pay $19, they already got their eraser. So they're not going to raise their hand. So what do I have to do? I have to lower the price. So I say, how about $18? Somebody says, okay, I'll give you $18. A monopolist cannot do that. If a monopolist wants to sell two erasers, they cannot sell one for $20 and one for $19. If they want to sell both erasers, they're going to have to charge one price. And the only price that they can charge and be able to sell those two erasers is $19. Because the person who was willing to pay $19, they're going to pay $19. Then the person who was willing to pay $20, they're also going to be willing to pay $19. And if the monopolist wants to sell three erasers, they cannot charge $20, $19, and 18, they cannot charge two for 19 and one for 18. They're going to have to charge all three at $18. So the monopolist has to lower the price on all the previous units, on all the units. So here is what's happening with the marginal revenue for a monopolist. Okay, now at $20, there were able to sell one unit. So the contribution to the revenue of the first unit is $20. But for them to be able to sell two units, they have to lower the price on both units at $19. So at $19, they're able to sell two units. And if they want to sell three units, they're going to have to sell all three units for $18. So let's put down at $18, they're able to sell three units. Okay. Now, I'm going to put a little table here. I'm going to say <clears throat> a price, $21, 20 19 18. Quantity sold at $21, zero units. 21, 19, two, 18, three. Let's see what is the total revenue at those values. Total revenue, when we sell zero units, obviously is going to be zero. Total revenue. When I sell one unit, it's going to be $20. Total revenue when I sell two units 
is two times $19, the price, or $38. And total revenue, when I sell three units, is $54. Now we can calculate marginal revenue, which is the contribution of an additional unit to the revenue. So marginal revenue. It might, makes no sense to say what, what is the contribution of the zeroth unit. So I'm gonna draw a line. Certainly the first unit contributed $20 to my revenue. Okay. But notice that when I sell one unit, I get $20 in revenues. When I sell two units, I get $38 in revenues. That means that the second unit by itself contributed only $18 in revenue. When I sell two units, my total revenue is $38. But if I sell three units, my total revenue is $54. So the third unit by itself contributed another $16. Okay. Now, notice that, okay, the price for the first unit was $20 and it contributed $20 to me. Okay, that's fine. Sounds fair. But the price of the second unit is $19. But the second unit only contributes $18 to me. So I sell something for 19, but it only contributes 18 to me. Why is that? Why is it the marginal revenue less than the price of the unit? Why is it that the second unit contributes less than what I'm selling it for? And the reason is because in order for me to sell that second unit, I had to lower the price on the first unit by a dollar. So while I sell the second unit for $19, I had to lower the price on the first unit by a dollar. So I lost a dollar. So that means that the second unit contributes to me 19 minus one or $18. Then notice that when I sell the third unit, when I sell three units, I'm selling all three units for $18. The third unit, I sold it for $18, but it contributes only $16 to me. Why is it that I sell for 18 and contributes only 16? Because what I had to do is I had to lower the price on the previous two units from $19 to $18. So I lost a dollar from each of the previous two units. So the contribution of the third unit to me, to the revenue, is not the price, but it's the price minus how much I lost by lowering the price on the previous units. And I lost $2, so it's $16. Okay. Let's graph this. When I sell one unit, price is $20, marginal revenue is $20. So marginal revenue lies on the demand curve with the first unit. But with the second unit, the price is $19, but marginal revenue is $18. So marginal revenue is no longer on the demand curve, is below the demand curve because it's less than the price. With three units, I sell them for $18, but marginal revenue is $16 for the third unit. So now if I draw a line through those marginal revenue points, I'm gonna come up with my marginal revenue curve. And unlike in perfect competition for the perfectly competitive firm where the demand was horizontal and marginal revenue was constant, was the same as the price, here, marginal revenue is less than the price. Marginal revenue is gonna lie below the demand curve because we always find the price on the demand curve, but marginal revenue is less than the price. 
So the marginal revenue curve is going to lie below the demand curve. That's the main difference between perfectly competitive firm and the monopolist. The monopolist's marginal revenue curve lies below the demand because marginal revenue is less than the price of the product. Each unit contributes actually less than the price that I'm selling it for. Okay. Now, another thing that I want you to notice is marginal revenue actually went negative. That means that, that means that, for example, this unit here, this unit here, what, whatever unit is, that is, the 10th unit, the 20th unit, the 20th, doesn't matter. This unit here, while I'm selling it for this positive price, it actually contributed, contributes a negative number to the revenue. It contributes negatively to the revenue. It makes my revenue go down. So how is it possible to sell something for a positive price, but it actually takes away from my revenue? It makes my revenue go down because the marginal revenue, how much it contributes is a negative number. Well, let me show you how that is possible. Let's suppose that I'm selling 20 units of a good. At $10. That's the price quantity and price. And I want to sell more units. I want to sell not 20, but I want to sell 21 units. Well, what does the monopolist have to do if they want to increase the number of units that they sell? The answer is they have to lower the price. Okay. And it turns out that if I want to sell 21 units, I'm going to have to lower the price to $9. So only when I lower the price from 10 to nine, that attracts somebody else who's going to willing, be willing to buy the good, and therefore I'm going to be able to sell 21 units. Let's take a look at what is the marginal revenue of the 21st unit. In other words, how much money did it put in my pocket by selling that 21st unit? Well, how do we do that? Very simple. We calculate total revenue with 20 units. Then we calculate total revenue with 21 units. And then we see, well, what's the difference between 20 units and 21 units? What's the difference between total revenue with 20 and total revenue with 21? Well, total revenue with 20 units is 200 bucks. $10 is the price times quantity. Total revenue with 21 units is equal to 189. $9 times 21 units, that's 189. As you see, when we go from total revenue to total one, total revenue for, with 21 units, total revenue actually goes down. So marginal revenue, of the 21st unit, the contribution of the 21st unit to my total revenue is going to be minus 11 bucks. So uh, the 21st unit actually took money out of my pocket. It took 11 bucks out of my pocket. I didn't sell it for a negative price. I sold it for $9 but I lost $11. How come? Well, here is how I lost 11 bucks. When I sold 21 units, the 21st unit contributed $9. So plus $9 in my pocket. But at the same time, I had to lower the price on all previous 20 units. So minus $20 out of my pocket. 
minus 20 plus 9 equals minus 11. So obviously, that was not a smart thing to do. Basically, I had to lower the price too much in order to gain one unit in sales. Okay. Let me clear the board and do a new, not, nice new graph. Here's the demand curve. Here's the marginal revenue curve. We know what marginal cost curve is going to look like. It's going to be a U-shaped curve where it goes down and it goes up. We did this in the chapter on production costs. Okay, now, question is, how many units should this firm produce if they want to profit maximize? And the answer is just like we did in perfect competition. You're going to produce a unit for as long as contributes more to the revenues than to the cost. As long as they put more money in my pocket, the unit puts more money in my pocket than it costs me to produce it, that it takes out of my pocket, it makes sense for me to produce it. So, all those units where marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost, it makes sense to produce. Up to Q star. And Q star is going to take place where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Same as in perfect competition. We have exactly the same principle. It, it only makes sense to produce a unit for as long as it puts more money in your pocket than it takes out of your pocket. If I go to Q star plus one, one more unit, the contribution to the cost is gonna be this value here. The contribution to the revenue is gonna be this value here. I would never produce a unit that is gonna contribute $8 to the revenues and $10 to the cost. So I will always stop where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That's gonna give me the profit maximizing quantity. But notice that unlike the perfectly competitive firm, the monopolist can pick their own price. The perfectly competitive firm had no control whatsoever over the price. The price was determined in the market and they could sell as much or as little as they wanted in that market. For the monopolist, they are not a price taker, so they can set their own price. Well, what price should they charge? Well, the answer is the maximum, maximum possible price that will ensure that they will sell Q star units. So we know that they need to sell Q star units in order to maximize profit. Now, how much can they charge and get away with selling? that quantity and the way we're going to find the maximum price is we're going to go from this q star from this quantity we're going to go all the way up to the demand curve and here is going to be the p star let's say that's the maximum possible price that they can charge and still be able to sell that quantity. Because remember, when we talk about demand curve, we say, well, what does it show? It shows at each and every price what the quantity demanded is. So we already know that at this price, they will be able to sell this quantity. If they were to charge a higher price, this price, they would not be able to sell that quantity. If they charge this price, the maximum they could sell is this quantity. So this is 
the maximum price that the monopolist can charge and get away with selling to star units. Could they charge a lower price? Of course they could. But then if they charge a lower price, they will start, they will produce a unit that's not going to maximize their profit. But somebody may say, but why don't they charge a lower price, produce Q star units, and then stop producing? And the answer is simple. Why would you charge a lower price and sell Q star units when you can charge a higher price and sell Q star units? Obviously, you're going to make more profits when you charge a higher price and sell Q star units than a lower price and sell Q star units. So you want to produce Q star units and you want to charge the maximum price and you find that on the demand curve and then you go to the Y axis. Okay, now, so far we have price and we have quantity. We know how many units and what price the monopolist is going to charge. Are they making a profit or a loss? And the answer is, I don't know. Because so far I have P and I have Q. All I can derive from P and Q is total rev revenue. Because total revenue is P times Q. So this area here, this area here is total revenue. Price times quantity multiplying two sides of a rectangle gives us the, the area. And this area here is the total revenue. To find the profit, we need also the total cost, not just total revenue, but total cost. And just like we did it with perfectly competitive firm, we need to put on this graph another curve, the average total cost curve. Okay. Now we have the average total cost curve. Now we can calculate our total cost. So we can compare total revenue with total cost. Which one is greater? And in this case, all I have to do is go from Q star all the way to the average total cost curve. And I can read what is the average cost of a unit. And as you can see, in my graph, the average cost of a unit is greater than the price. In other words, each unit costs me $15 on average to produce, and each unit I'm selling for $10. Guess what? I'm losing money. I'm losing $5 per unit. This vertical distance here, $15 minus $10 equals $5. That is the loss per unit or the average loss. And if I multiply the loss per unit times the number of units, I'm gonna have this rectangle here, that area. And that area represents the total loss. I lose $5 per unit and I produce 10 units, Q star, let's say 10 units. That means that I lose altogether $50. Five per unit times 10 units equal $50. So this monopolist is losing money. Question is, what should they do? And is no different than perfectly comp uh, competition. In perfect competition, when you were losing money, you had to see whether you are covering the variable cost or not. Same thing here. We need, if we're losing money, if the monopolist is losing money, we need the average variable cost. If the average variable cost is higher than the price, then we should shut down. If the average variable cost is lower than the price, we should stay in business until the lease is up. So basically, if the average variable cost looks like this, we're going to stay in business because the price is higher than the ABC. So this is ABC for stay in business. 
losing money, losing money, but I'll stay in business until the end of the lease. Let me show you now a situation where the monopolist is losing money and they should shut down. Okay, we have marginal revenue, marginal cost. We know Q star. We know the price they're gonna charge. Average total cost. Average variable cost. As you can see, the price is below the average variable cost. Obviously, it's going to be below the average total cost. The firm's revenue, revenues are not even able to pay for the labor cost. So not only do they have to pay out of their pocket the whole fixed cost, but also some of the labor cost. They're betting off, shutting down, getting rid of the labor, and only have to pay the fixed cost out of their pocket. So this is a shutdown. If this monopolist shuts down, they're gonna be stuck only with the fixed cost. If they stay in business, they gotta pay the fixed cost out of their pocket and they gotta pay some of the labor cost, the variable cost out of their pocket. You're better off shutting down. Okay, in this situation, what do we have? We have a monopolist who's making positive economic profits. As you can see, the price is up here. This is P star. And the average cost of a unit is this value here. That's the APC. So the average cost of a unit may be, let's say, $3 and the price is $8, that means that I'm making $5 per unit. And then if I multiply this $5 per unit times the number of units, I'm gonna get this area and that's gonna be the economic profit. Economic profit, again, it's abnormal profit. They're making way too much money. But unlike the perfectly competitive firm, if the monopolist is able to prevent others from entering their industry, they're gonna be able to maintain those profits in the long run. That was impossible for the perfectly competitive firm. They could not keep others from entering. So if the perfectly competitive firm would have a situation like this, uh, 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 an economic profit in the short run, in the long run, that will disappear because others will enter the industry. Okay, now. The monopolist and price discrimination. 
Okay. Remember, when I told you that if the monopolist wants to sell additional units, they have to lower the price on all their units, not on just the additional unit, but on all the units. But what if they could get away with lowering the price on just the additional unit? What would happen to the profits? Imagine this, I'm selling this eraser for 20 bucks. Somebody's willing to offer 20 bucks. Okay, great. And then I say, they come up with the second one and I say, hey, anybody willing to pay me $19? Somebody says, okay, I'll give you $19. That's actually called price discrimination. When you cannot price discriminate, if I wanna sell two units, I cannot sell one for 20 and the other one for 19. I have to sell both units for $19. So what's the difference between the first case and the second case? Who's gonna make more money? And obviously the answer is, if you're selling one for 20 and one for 19, it's better than selling both for 19. In one case, you're gonna make $39. In the other case, you make $38. So what's this price discrimination about? Price discrimination has nothing to do with race, religion, or anything else. Price discrimination has to do with a firm, a monopolist, detecting they have two or more groups of people who have different willingness to pay for a product. So one group, let's say that you have two groups of people and one group really wants it badly and the other group is kind of lukewarm, you know. Uh, If you cannot price discriminate, it, well, if you can price discriminate, if you could price discriminate, obviously the people who want it badly, you're going to charge them a high price. The people who don't want it that bad, you're going to charge them a lower price. If you cannot price discriminate and you want to sell to both groups, then you're going to have to charge both groups the low price. Don't think that you can do an average because the people who are only willing to pay the low price, they're not gonna pay the higher average. So it's gotta be the low price, the lowest common denominator. So a monopolist would like to price discriminate, but supposedly is against the law to price discriminate. Price discrimination allows for higher profits but it shouldn't take place, but it does take place. And we all know how I start my classes with, have you seen any movies lately? Well, guess what? Movie theaters price discriminate all the time. How do they price discriminate? Well, they have general admission prices and they have students and seniors prices. And students and senior prices are not the same as general admission. So they have two groups of people, seniors and students, one group, everybody else, another group. Different prices, different groups of people. What's the assumption here? And obviously the assumption is that students and seniors are not willing to pay as high as general admission, because the assumption is that if you're a student, you know, you don't earn that much money. If you're a senior, you don't earn that much money and therefore you're not willing to pay as much. On the other hand, the other group may be willing to pay more, so you're gonna charge them a higher price. A airlines also uh, practice price discrimination. Think of business travel versus leisure travel. Well, who's willing to pay a higher price? The obvious, the obvious answer is business travelers. They have to attend the conference. They have to attend the meeting. Uh, 
there's nothing that much they can do. So the airline is going to charge them a higher price. But obviously, they, they're not going to ask you over the phone, want to buy a ticket, uh, are you business traveler or leisure traveler? Because if you're a business traveler, man, we're going to give it to you. You're going to pay a high price. No, they can't do that. But they find ways of finding out whether you're a business traveler or not. And the one way they use is if you are able to stay three or four days or five days in the city that you're traveling to, we're going to give you a lower price. If you're not able to stay five days over there, then we're going to give you a higher price. And obviously, a business traveler has to attend the conference, has to attend the sales meeting or whatever. They cannot hang around for another four or five days over there just to get the lower price. So they're going to have, so, so there are ways of finding out oh, who's willing to pay more and who's willing to pay less. Of course, for this uh, uh, price discrimination to be able to exist, uh, somehow uh, the business, the, the price discriminator have to be able, has to be able to, to prevent the resale of their product from one group to another group. So you, you know, uh, if movie tickets look the same, whether it's senior and student or general admission, you could just go over there, buy as a student 100 tickets, and then again hang around the front of the movie theater and go, Psst, how about I give you a good price? Yeah. You bought it for five, they buy it from you for seven, and they don't have to pay $9 as general admission. So they have to be able to prevent the, the resale. And also, Another uh, condition that has to be met for price discrimination to exist uh, it the cost of finding out, the cost of determining that there are two or more groups of people has to be less than the increase in profits that you're making from selling at those groups of people. Sometimes it's very expensive to determine do we have more than one group of people, should we price discriminate? Well, well, if it's very expensive to determine that, then maybe it's not worth it. Uh, one more thing about price discrimination. Price discrimination has only to do with differences in prices because different groups have different willingness to pay for those products. Different, if differences in prices come from differences in costs, then that's not price discrimination. Let me give you an example. You see one mobile, mobile station selling gas at one price in one neighborhood, and they sell gas at another price in another neighborhood. And in one neighborhood, the incomes are lower. In another neighborhood, the incomes are higher. And obviously, you see higher prices maybe in the higher income neighborhood and lower prices for the gas in the lower income neighborhood. And you say, well, this station is price discriminating. One group is willing to pay more. The other one is willing to pay less. Voila, price discrimination. But it could be that those differences stem not from price discriminating, but the fact that in one neighborhood, the gas station has higher rent and the other neighborhood has low rent. So when differences in prices stem from differences in cost, then that is no longer price discrimination. Okay. Now let's, let's do a, a little problem like we did with perfect competition. And I say to you, well, 
what should this firm do? Well, I'm sorry, let me change the problem just a little. I'm making marginal revenue and marginal cost equal to each other. So we, are, we know that we are at Q star. But then I say, should this firm uh, stay in business, shut down, whatever? The answer is, I don't know. I don't know because I did not give you enough information. Unlike perfect competition, marginal revenue for the monopolist is no longer the same as the price. Marginal revenue is below the price, so price is above marginal revenue. So I don't know what's happening. With monopoly, I have to give you the price for you to make decisions. Okay. So with monopoly, first thing that you do is, is marginal revenue equal to marginal cost? If they are different, if they are not equal, if they are different, then it's going to be a matter of increasing output or decreasing output. If marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost, increase output. If marginal revenue is less than marginal cost, decrease up. Okay, so like with perfect competition, you have to look at marginal revenue and marginal cost. Are you at Q star? If you're not at Q star, then you wanna to move to Q star. So price is 20, marginal revenue is $16, marginal cost is $16, average total cost is equal to $14, average variable cost is equal to $12. This is a very happy monopolist because they're making positive economic profit. They are making, let's see, $6 per unit profit, $6 per unit. We don't know what is the total profit because we don't have a Q star. But I'm selling something for 20 and it's costing me an average of 40. So $6 per unit. They should not do anything. They should be, they're making the maximum po possible profit. Uh, I changed it and I made average total cost equals 24. Average variable cost equals 18. Folks, we're losing money because I'm selling each unit for 20 and it costing me 24. I'm losing $4 per unit. But since the price is higher than the average variable cost, that means that I am covering the variable cost and I should stay in business because whatever is left over after I paid the variable cost, that can go towards paying the fixed cost so I don't have to pay the whole fixed cost out of my pocket. So here, I'm gonna stay in business until the lease is up. Now, I'm losing money. Price is 20, average total cost 24. I'm losing four bucks a unit. But I'm not even able to cover the variable cost. Price is less than the average variable cost. What should I do? I should shut down. Sorry about that. Okay, so 
like with perfect competition, uh, when a monopoly shuts down, uh, they're going to be stuck with the fixed cost. They're going to have to pay the whole fixed cost out of their pocket. So if the price is above the average variable cost, they ought to shut down. If the price is below the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. If the price is above the average variable cost, they're covering the variable cost and therefore they should stay in business. If the price is below the average variable cost, they cannot cover the variable cost and they should shut down. Okay. The monopolists can have positive, zero or negative economic profits in the short run, just like perfectly competitive firm. But unlike the perfectly competitive firm, the monopolist will be able to have either zero or positive economic profits in the long run. The perfectly competitive firm can only have zero because over there it's easy to get in, easy to get out. The monopolist has the ability to have barriers to entry and those barriers to entry, which we talked at the beginning of the class, um, legal barriers, uh, economies of scale, or ownership of re a resource, those barriers are able to keep out the competition. And therefore, the monopolists keep, keep, can keep having uh, positive economic profits time after time after time. So they can have positive economic profits in the long run. Okay, now uh, just a little announcement. Um, it's not for the next lecture, but hopefully for the lecture on the review for test two. I'm going to have some lights that I bought just yesterday. They're coming in in about a week. And we're going to place those lights and we're going to make more like studio like. So uh, hopefully it's going to be a little bit better. Okay, folks, hope you enjoyed this. Have a good day. Bye-bye.